So as to Robert Albritton, I think many of you know him. He's uh, well known in the Washington area for, for many things that I'll talk about. Uh, most recently, uh, it was in the news that he sold a company that he started or a publication that he started called Politico, and we'll talk about that, sold that to Axel Springer at a pretty good profit, we'll mention in the not too distant future. Um, he is a native of, uh, well, born in Houston, grew up in Washington, went to college at Wesleyan, where he served on the board of trustees for a while. He has his own uh, uh, mid-market uh, private equity fund called Perpetual Capital Partners, which focuses on uh, mid-market investments kind of in the, uh, the space in the Washington, D.C. area. He's also a uh, person who's on the board of directors of the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation. Um, his family has its roots in Texas, and he's been very involved in a number of things in Texas. So, Robert, thank you very much for joining us. And, of course, the most important thing in your career is being a member of the board of the, of the Economic Club of Washington. Would you agree? Absolutely, 100%. Thank you for having me, David. Okay. So uh, people woke up not long ago and maybe a little surprised that Politico, something that you conceived and put together and funded, uh, was sold to Axel Springer for roughly a billion dollars, which is a pretty good profit, as I understand, uh, from what you invested in it. So uh, let's talk about why you decided to sell at this time and why to Axel Springer. Yeah, sure. No, thanks. It's a, uh, thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, let me start by saying the decision to sell was not an easy one. Uh, I've been thinking about it for many years and through multiple lenses. And there were really three ways I looked at the question. You know, first, what's best for Politico, the publication? Second, what's best for my colleagues who make Politico fresh every day? And then lastly, what's best for me and my family? Um, and, and I care very deeply for Politico. I, I think all founders care deeply for anything that they, they start from scratch. Um, uh, but I also hope that I have enough self-awareness to know that most founders arrive at the point uh, where they've reached their peak level of contribution to their own creation. Uh, and the, the idea of personally continuing to lead the mission of Politico is it's enchanting, it's intoxicating, but that really is not enough of a reason just to keep it as mine. Um, so I came to the conclusion that Politico would be able to achieve its full potential faster as part of a larger international media company than remaining solely a family owned business. And I felt a responsibility to the publication and those who built it with me. So I really thought that a sale was in their professional best interest, uh, being able to, to bring in a, a larger partner. So what came after that was really the question of what's best for me and my family. And fortunately, the, the timing was good. Our performance had really taken off. The market was hot. Uh, you know, we'd, uh, we were finishing up a year where, you know, profitability was well over $50, $60 million dollars. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of brought it to then why your question of Axel Springer. Um, I'd known that I'd worked with Axel Springer for about seven years. Uh, they were our 50-50 partner uh, in our European joint venture. And we shared a, a similarly high level of journalistic ambition, as well as a belief that strong profits build strong, sustainable media companies. So we had a shared vision. Uh, but most importantly, it was obvious they really cared and admired Politico. Uh, it was important to me that the new owner had feelings about the place that were as deep and as positive my own. And from that point forward, the, the deal was really relatively easy to put together. So did you hire an investment banker and shop it or they just approached you and because you're, they're your, they are your joint venture partner in Europe and they were the logical partner? Did you say to them, well, that's a good offer. I'm going to go look for some others? Yeah, it was really it's sort of none of the above. I hate to say it. You know, uh, we were we were having these kind of discussions over the years, you know, because of the European side as, as to, you know, where we wanted to take that relationship. And it, it seemed to alternate between, well, maybe we'll buy you out or maybe Axel Springer will invest more in us. Um, and, you know, honestly, a few years ago, I set some goals for myself and the company and, and I wanted Politico to reach at least $150 million in revenue, at least a 25% operating margin. I don't want it to be worth uh, at least a billion dollars. And we reached those goals, uh, you know, in, in early, uh, earlier this year and, and, or last year, I should say. And I was on an unrelated call with Matthias Doffner, who, who runs Axel Springer. And I told him of our performance. And I said, you know, Matthias, if that's worth a billion to, dollars to you, you can buy it. Um, and his answer was a, a two-letter word. 
Um, now, in English, two letters normally means no. Fortunately, he's German, and the two-letter word was ja. Uh, you know, and it, it really was, it was, okay. that was in June, and uh, we kept it a very small, very small group. Um, uh, um, Duncan Evans, who works in my office, knew about it. Uh, uh, Matthias Doffner knew about it. Jan Beyer, who's Matthias's number two, knew about it. And their CFO, and we kept it that way for a good four weeks until a term sheet was hammered out. And you know, it just came together very, very quickly. So it was reported in the press that I read that uh, he originally made an offer to you a couple of years ago for two hundred and fifty million dollars. So I guess you're glad you held out, right? Yeah, that absolutely. And you know, there, there have been these ongoing offers over time. Fortunately, the number kept going up. Uh, you know. <laughs> okay. So um, the employees of Axel Springer uh, have to agree to a certain code. Uh, they have to agree on the Transatlantic Alliance. They have to be supportive of Israel and so forth. Um, but your employees at Politico will not have to agree to that. How did you manage to get that uh, taken care of? I, I didn't, actually. Uh, they, they came to that conclusion on their own. And I think that kind of speaks to the relationship that we had. We, we'd worked for seven years in Europe, and we'd never had a disagreement. Um, you know, it was, it was a very professional, very cordial kind of relationship. But I, I never had to bring it up with them. Uh, I asked him, I said, what are your intentions? I said, you know, it, it's different in Europe. Um, this is America. We understand. Um, you know, we would, we would hope that, that you know, the, the, all of our portfolio companies would sort of represent these ideals. Uh, but we're not going to make them, you know, sign anything that seems a little over the top. So the deal closed in October. And usually when a deal closes, the owner... Um, publisher is uh, asked to uh, go to a farewell dinner and so forth, but you're still the, the publisher. So are you going to keep staying there as the publisher? Well, because of COVID, they haven't given me the dinner yet. So, you know, I, I can't leave quite yet. Uh, yeah. The, you know, again, you know, we, they do, it happened quickly. They didn't really have a team to come in. Uh, I was actually looking for a, a CEO uh, to replace Patrick Steele, who did a wonderful job for us. And so I basically just, you know, I said, you're going to want to hire a CEO. Here's all the research. It's been done. Um, and, and so they just started down that process of finding somebody new. Um, and uh, they've done that. Um, they've hired a, a goalie, Sheikh Olislami. Um, say that name 10 times fast. Uh, and she starts, uh, I think, in about two weeks. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to start a natural transition away from a managerial role and become more of an advisor uh, serve on the board. I think that's the right thing to do. You know, the founder can't run the place forever. Um, but there's this high level of trust. So they were, they were very happy with, with myself and, and others continuing to run the company. We, we actually overachieved the budget for them at the end of the year and under their ownership. So I, you know, I guess that's sort of testament to that. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but they, they said, look, this has been our smoothest transition of any acquisition we've ever, ever done. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's worked. So the current state of Politico, how many employees do you have? Um, how many different uh, publication v uh, v venues do you have? And what's the basic model? It's a subscription model. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's a combination model. We've got about a thousand employees now. Uh, we're, we're trying to catch up with Carlisle. We haven't gotten there yet, you know, one day. Uh, we've got about 760 in the US, about 200 in Europe, and then the rest are sort of scattered around. Um, offices are in... Uh, Washington, D.C., uh, New York City, Albany, Sacramento, San Francisco, Tallahassee, and then Europe, we're in Brussels, London, Paris, Berlin. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's a nice revenue mix. About half the revenue is from business to business subscriptions, not consumer subscriptions. Um, and the other half is through, you know, sponsorships and advertising and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's really an interesting publication. We've we've always tried to target uh, influential readers, not necessarily the mass public. So it's it's always been a bit of a business to business publication. So it is said by President Kennedy very famously that uh, victory has a uh, hundred fathers, defeat is an orphan. So who are the hundred fathers that helped put together Politico? Uh, was it your idea, or how did the idea come about? Yeah, I, you know, it, 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 again, a great question. I, I, I've always sort of said, I, I feel like I'm the Hollywood producer. You know, my job is to hire the best uh, director, get the best script, get the best sound job, cinematographer, actors, and then get the hell out of the way and let them produce a good movie. Um, but it, really it was, I think there were four people that were in from the, the foundation of Politico itself, you know, as its incarnation as Politico. And that would be Fred Ryan, who's now running the Washington Post, uh, Jim Vandehei, who went off to form Axios, 
and John Harris, who's uh, you know still our founding editor at Politico. So um, a few years ago, uh, a few people left to start uh, Axios. Um, was that uh, something that worried you that they'd be a competitor? And what's the relationship been between the two of you? And it, was it true that that Axel Springer was thinking of buying Axios as well? Yeah, I, you know, um, I, so I, I was never really that concerned when they were leaving because, uh, you know, it, it was a difficult time, I think, for the for the publication because it was just such a big change. You know, you, you've had the same crew who's been in there the whole time. And uh, I think it was a big challenge for us. I think it was a, a big step up as far as, you know, how we transformed that company where we were about 200, 250 people into something that was more sustainable economically going, but they said they were going off to do something new and different. And I, th I think they've done that. You know, they were more interested in, in uh, you know, sort of short form, uh, you know, quick bullet pointy kind of journalism for folks who are on the go and, and, and don't have much time. And, you know, we were, we were much more interested in, in sort of providing a more in-depth information uh, and, and more granular information, I think, than they were, they were looking to do. They wanted to have a broader product. Uh, they wanted to go beyond politics and policy and, and cover all sorts of things. And I, I think one of the, the magics of Politico is, you know, we've always stayed very targeted. We've always stayed, you know, squarely looking at politics and policy, squarely looking, looking at it from a, a you know, nonpartisan, independent point of view. I know that's old fashioned. And we were really trying to deliver it to, you know, maybe five, 10,000 people, you know, who were really influential, either, either high ranking government officials, elected officials, or, you know, folks who are really part of the Washington ecosystem that, that, you know, makes the town work. So, and, and we weren't worried about the other portion of the audience. So when you are writing or publishing stories that are controversial, or they're making some politicians or public figures look bad, did you ever get calls from those public figures? The president of the United States ever call you and say, don't do this, or how could you do this? A absolutely, all the time. Um, you know, I, I, that was, I think, my other principal job was, you know, um, those keeper of the shield. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I always backed up my editors. Um, you know, frequently, believe it or not, the publisher doesn't know usually what gets published before it comes out. And so, you know, the first reaction is, let me go look into it. And I'd always just follow up to make sure that everything was done properly. Um, nine times out of 10, it was somebody who just didn't like it. Um, you know, and I said, well, is there anything that's factually inaccurate here? Well, no, but I don't like it. Well, would you like to, would you like to say something on the record to count, you know, to, to present the other point of view? Oh, no, no, I don't want it to be off on the record. I just want it to go away. Well, that, that I can't do. Um, okay. No. So when you were starting, uh, some of the people who helped start it were at the Washington Post. So you were recruiting them away. Did Don Graham call you up and say, don't do this or this will never work? Or why are you doing this? No, I mean, Don was, I mean, Don did try and keep, uh, keep them there at the post. And he did offer them, you know, sort of to create a publication within a publication. Um, but I think, I think they realized that would just be very difficult to do in the environment of the post and, and have, you know, allow it to have the independence to, to, to go on its own. Uh, and so, you know, we all, we all kind of did a big leap of faith together. Um, and, um, it, 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 you know, it worked out, it, we knew pretty early on, it was, it was going to be a, a good idea and would work out pretty well. So let's talk about uh, your family background for a moment. Uh, your father was a very famous uh, businessman in Texas, uh, born in Mississippi, uh, made some money in Houston. Uh, what propelled him to come to Washington, D.C. in the 1970s? So he, uh, 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 the story is I am, am, am told Cliff Folger uh, introduced him to the Kaufman and the Noyes families who owned the Washington Star at the time and basically talked him into buying the Washington Star. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, he came up here, he commuted for about a year. And then uh, my mother said, I can't have this man commuting back and forth to Texas. So we all moved up um, a year afterwards. Um, but I, I kind of spent my first few years in Washington, hanging out at the Washington Star. Um, so I think that was kind of my first taste of, of media and newspapers and, and that sort of thing. And, and I think that got implanted pretty deeply in a seven, eight year old, you know, uh, as to this is a pretty cool thing to do and, and pretty impactful and pretty meaningful. Um, and then, you know, he, he stayed on, he went, he reverted back to his previous calling, which was banking um, uh, after right. the star uh, process. Um, but, you know, that, that's what originally brought us here. So uh, you're the only child of uh, 
your father and your mother is also a very prominent person in Washington. So what was it like growing up in Washington with such a prominent uh, set of parents? And did you, that make you want to get out of Washington or stay in Washington? No, they made they you know they were they made it easy. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think we're both only children, so you know, it's sort of a, it's a you know you, you you tend to grow up around adults a little bit more, which probably makes Washington a little easier to deal with. Um, but uh, no, they you know they they never they they always said, look, you you can do anything you want with your life. Just you know, we want you to try your hardest. We want you to you know to be the best person you can be at whatever you decide you want to do. Um, so I, I never really got pushed into to family businesses or anything like that. But uh, you know, they were they, when we first came here, it was a star. The star was losing a million dollars a month, which was big money in the '70s. So they were out every single night, you know, with uh, advertisers trying to work at that company. Um, so. You know, new to town, that was a little, that was a little tough for a first grader, you know, kind of, you, know, you lost all your friends in, in Houston and, and you lost your parents at the same time. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they were, they were always around. My dad was always just incredibly welcoming and supportive. He, you know, anytime he was on a phone call or running business, I mean, he said, come on in and just sit and listen, you know, and uh, always had an open door policy, even as a, as a young kid. So I, I got a lot of exposure to a lot of things um, from an early age in DC and I really liked it. From an early age, uh, you were interested in computers, as I understand it, and also uh, very interested in flying. So as the only child of your parents, did your parents say, do not learn how to fly? It's too dangerous? No, uh, I think my mother, my, I think my dad had a little more, uh, you know, a little, uh, uh, was a little more uh, trusting in, in the process. My mother was a little more feared, but I, I think, I, I still can't believe she did this. I think like five days after I got my pilot's license, she said, okay, take me flying. You know, I took her up a little single engine plane and I, we safely made it back on the ground. And in retrospect, I was like, wow, that was a, a serious uh, endorsement and, and, and confidence in your kid to do that. Because uh, uh, I think if any of my three kids had tried to do that, I'd be no, no, you, you can go for a year or two and then I'll go with you. <laughs> so um, when your father passed away, you became in charge of the uh, All Britain family business, which in, consisted of the Riggs Bank at the time and a number of television stations. Why did you ultimately sell the bank and sell the television stations? Well, I had actually been running the TV stations at that point in time for um, I, probably about five years, uh, more than five years. And, and they, were, they were run as an investment by professionals. Uh, so, you know, I worked with my dad, but I never really worked for my dad. And um, he came and said, I've, I've got cancer and I'm not going to live. And, you know, will you, will you take over the bank for me? And, you know, you're as an only child, you're not going to tell your dying father, no. Um, and, and so I jumped in, I, I was really fortunate. The, uh, the guys who I were, was working with in the TV stations, they were former bankers. And so they really understood commercial banking fairly well. And so I kind of drafted the same team and we, you know, parachuted in on a top layer and, and ran rigs for uh, a few years. It was, uh, it was interesting. It was, a, you know, we, we were on a path to kind of modernize it and, 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 and bring it along. Um, and all sorts of, you know, I, I discovered uh, the lesson uh, that a lot of people uh, in, in business discover, you know, one person lying and another person uh, cheating uh, can destroy an entire institution all by themselves. And you don't even know it. Uh, until it's too late. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what happened to Riggs. Uh, although that's, you know, Riggs is, that could be an, an interview all unto itself. <laughs> it's just as a, was a, a quite the wild story, but, but a lot of good experiences came out of that. And I took a lot of those kind of experiences and rolled it into when we started Politico, because, you know, there was an understanding, especially from the client point of view, uh, especially from the corporate world with government relations of what their needs really were. And if companies were facing crisis, you know, you could honestly say, I've been there, done that. I, I understand what you're going through and I understand the process. And uh, it, it was a very different perspective. So now that uh, Politico has been sold and at some point you will probably just become a part-time advisor if that, what are you going to spend your uh, bulk of your day doing? Investing or starting a new venture? What are your interests? Yeah, plotting and scheming. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's actually, the, you know, this, this has been a bit of a transition and I, I am looking forward to a little bit of time just to, to gather some thoughts. I've got some, I've got some interesting ideas on where, where media could go, uh, maybe some combination of media and education uh, that, that could kind of tickle a couple of my, my you know, uh, things that I like. Um, but, you know, 
stay tuned. Uh, I, I think there's some, there's some fun things that are going to come out of this. And, uh, you know, I think some ways that hopefully will be, uh, helpful for the city, helpful for the country. Uh, you know, and, um, if I can contribute to, to the well being of the country, I'd like to do that. So what are your, uh, principal philanthropic interests at this point? And do you expect to expand that at some point? Yeah, they've, they've all been education in, in, in origin. You know, I've, I've always had this philosophy that, um, it's the one thing you can't take away from someone. If they have a degree, if they have an education, they can, they can think for themselves, they can help themselves, uh, and, and no one can take that away from them. Um, and so that, that's been the, the principal focus of what I've been doing, be it at you know, secondary level, higher education, all that sort of thing. Uh, and, and we'll probably continue to be, to be that, that way. So you have three children or any of them interested in going into a family business that you might start or they're completely uninterested? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, ages nine, 10 and 14, who knows what they're going to do. Uh, if they wanted to, I would welcome it, but I, you know, I don't want to put them in a position where they, you know, it's, it's pre-programmed and that's what they're going to do. That's pretty much what my parents did with me. Uh, I was really lucky at one point in time, I was, you know, mid twenties. And my dad said, look, you know, if you want me to, if you've got an idea, if you want me to, you know, loan you a couple, 3 million bucks, uh, you know, at a decent rate and you want to start your own thing. He said, nothing will make me happier. And I sat there and said, dad, I appreciate it, but you know, I'm running the family TV stations right now. And quite frankly, you know, that the same amount of time I could spend over there where the company's got a hundred million dollars in revenue, I said, I can do a heck of a lot more good uh, on a larger scale than I can on a smaller scale. So I appreciate the offer, but I don't know if it's the right thing to do here. And, and he agreed. Um, so, you know, with, with wealth comes responsibility. And, you know, my, my fondest desires and dreams for those kids is they just wind up being, you know, a, a good, responsible stewards of the capital and contribute back to society and do it in a meaningful way and, and continue, continue to build it so they can keep on uh, making contributions was reported that at an early age, you, you decided you didn't like uh, working at uh, some part of your family's business and you retired in the early 20s. Uh, what did your father think of that? It was banking. It was, uh, you know, he would, I, I, I just got, I, I graduated from college. I went and got a pilot's license over the summer. And, you know, you know, day after Labor Day, it's, you know, what are you going to do? Well, we'll go, you know, come to the bank. We'll, we'll you know, here's a job. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was the sexy part of banking. I think it was doing equity, and, you know, uh, analysis work for the, for the investment side. And, um, I just couldn't stand it. I was, you know, this idealistic young college kid, I'm, you know, researching Philip Morris and like, this is just driving me insane. Uh, and just waiting every day for the, the clock to strike five so I could get out of there. And, uh, you know, I, I'd saved up a little bit of money, probably about, you know, 10, 15,000 bucks through college. And man, when you get done with college, you can live off 10 or $15,000 for a long time. You know, it doesn't, you know, beer money and, and you know, pretty cheap rent. That, that'll go a long way for you. And so I, I quit after 90 days. I, said, I can't do this. And uh, he would call me up. Um, this was his revenge. He'd call me up 630 every morning. Uh, he'd wait, you know, until I picked up the phone. Yeah. You know, it's like, Son, I've just got one question for you. What's it like to be your age and retired? I really want to know. <laughs> you know? And um, luckily, the, the guys who were running the TV stations, you know, they became aware of it. And they said, you know, if you're interested in learning about this, we, you know, we'd be happy to show you what we do. Um, and um, from there, I spent the next three years going around to each one of the markets, uh, you know, doing every single job from selling ads to sweeping floors to running cameras to writing copy and uh, just got to know the business from the ground up and you know uh, knew 1500 people when I got done with it and uh, was fortunate enough the guy who was running the group uh, decided to move on and uh, you know got the opportunity to try and, and, and run that company for a while. So when you're uh, running something like Politico and owning it you have to stay out of politics but now you don't have that constraint I presume <laughs> or you won't shortly so have you ever thought about um, going into government getting involved in politics by supporting candidates or running for office yourself? Yeah, that's, that's going to be, a, that's going to be a challenge because I've always used this, uh, you know, this thing of like, well, I'm sorry, you know, I'm publisher of Politico, so I can't get involved. But so I, I, that excuse is going away to a certain degree. Uh, I, I do want to get involved in media again. Uh, I do think, you know, um, uh, look, the, the there, there are, you know, there, there's academic scholars who, who have, I think, rightly pointed out that, you know, the First Amendment was really 
uh, one of the serious reasons for it was to form the fourth estate, which is a, you know, an unofficial check on the other three branches of government. And so I, I think anybody who works in journalism is, uh, it, you know, if they're really doing uh, their job well, they're, you know, they're being uh, intellectually honest, they're being unbiased, I think they are doing service to their country. So uh, to me, that's the best way to, to serve in, in a way that, in a capacity that I understand and, and in a way that I know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would like to get back into that um, in some way, shape or form. So as a businessman, are, are you worried about the state of the economy now? We have a lot of debt, we have high deficits, um, inflation is very high, or is this something that you're not that focused on because uh, your interest has been elsewhere? I have a ton of liquidity. I'm that guy who's like cheering every time the market goes down. I'm, I'm like the, the, the guy everybody hates right now. Uh, so am I concerned about it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, there does seem to be this feeling that the reckoning is out there at some point in time. Um, you know, as you rightly pointed out between valuations and debt and, and sort of this, you know, we seem to be in, uh, you know, completely uncharted territory multiples on, on private acquisitions are still through the roof. Uh, you know, it, it, it just, in my head, it, it doesn't add up. Maybe it's just a sign I'm getting older. Um, but it, you know, there, there seem to be all sorts of warnings, signals, uh, warning flags flying. And at the same time, you know, we, we still have an unprecedented liquidity in the country. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I should ask you for investment advice over here. So, uh, if the president of the United States called you up and said, uh, why don't you come in and be a cabinet officer or something like that? Your response would be, uh, thank you very much, but no, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've covered enough guys and it's, uh, I, I, I always said, look, I, I, I respect anyone who serves in government. I think it really is service. I think it's, um, you know, they're, uh, they're definitely not doing it for the money. Um, but it's, you know, it's, um, I, I'd rather have a ringside seat, uh, than necessarily go on the ring myself. And, and maybe that's a bit of a cowardly statement. Maybe it's a smart statement. I don't know, but um, but you know, I've just, I've been an observer of this for far too many years to, to really be intoxicated by, by that. Um, I I'd rather be the guy who's here for multiple administrations. You know, you do not seem to me as somebody with a prominent uh, figure be, be, who is, uh, can be a prominent figure in Washington who goes out to Cafe Milano or the Palm or other places when COVID wasn't around to kind of be seen and so forth. Or do you try to not be seen or not be that visible in, in Washington? No, I, I you know, I, I enjoy getting out as much as the next guy, but I'm probably not the guy who's, you know, living for the cocktail circuit either. Um, uh, that was, you know, um, I, I've always found some other folks in the organization where uh, they really enjoy it and they get a lot of energy from it. Uh, and for me, it's, you know, uh, I, I enjoy smaller gatherings with, with bright folks and discussing bright ideas. Um, and that usually doesn't happen in small talk. And your principal outside interests, other than flying, what, what, are, what are the things you care about? Yeah, do? I mean, you know, uh, uh, like I said, snow ski, a lot of work. I got to tell you that. been doing that over the past few years. You know, uh, you know it's just, it, it's, it feels like we've been running a marathon for the past 15 years. So, you know, a little breather is not so bad. Uh, but, um, but I think I'm going to be ready to jump back in pretty quickly um, after that. Uh, you know, but it, just, just a variety of things. And, you know, quite frankly, just raising kids is enough work as is. Okay. So uh, today, um, as you look at uh, what you can contribute to the country, you think your greatest contribution would be as, as an investor, as a businessman building a place that have that creates jobs or as a philanthropist what do you view as what you want to contribute to the country yeah i think you know to to a certain degree i think it's it's going back and uh i've been spending a lot of time thinking about the relationship between media the people and government um and what it's really going to take uh to uh, really to train great journalists going forward. Um, there's been so many changes in media that have been economically based in the past few years. Uh, you've had so many local papers that have shut down, um, you know, or have been severely cut back. Um, that There really aren't the kind of training grounds there used to be for young reporters coming up. And I'd really like to find a way uh, to give bright young reporters the experience uh, that they need uh, to really be of national quality, of national caliber, who can, you know, who can be good stewards of news and information in, in a positive way for the country. 
Uh, and so if, you know, I've got some creative ideas on that and, um, you know, maybe in quite frankly, you know, that could be in a for-profit way. It could be a not-for-profit way. Um, you know, we're just sort of toying around with ideas on that, but I, to me, that's what I know. I think that's the best way to serve. So, um, let me talk, ask you um, for a moment about your mother. She's a very prominent person in Washington, uh, hosts a lot of events, well-regarded for her philanthropy and other, other great skills. What was it like growing up in that house with all the famous people coming there all the time? And, and what about all that great art there? Did you realize how valuable that art was when you were growing up? I did. Uh, there, uh, 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 when uh, we first moved to Washington, uh, uh, touching, touching on the art, there was a, a, a Chagall, uh, very nice Chagall hanging in the, you know, in the, in the hallway. And uh, I was uh, called over to this uh, beautiful work of art at one point in time by my father and my mother. And they pointed in the corner and they said, what is this? And there was a little uh, uh, pencil doodle in the corner of a snowman. It was a scene of a, a church in the wintertime in the Alps. And there was this little pencil doodle of a snowman there. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I was given a, a full interrogation, you know, when did you doodle on the painting? Do you realize what this is worth? How could you do this? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. You know, it was probably one of your friends. Confess, confess, confess. And, you know, I had no idea how this thing got here or, you know, where it is from. Um, and uh, probably about a month later, there was a, a, an art expert from Sotheby's who happened to be in the house. And, uh, my dad mentioned, he said, yeah, I said, my son doodled on the painting. He said, he said, well, show it to me. He did. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, Chagall doodled on his paintings all the time. I'm sure this was the artist who did it himself. You oh. know, I was like, dad, I told you I didn't do it. You know, so it was, uh, it was a little bit of an interesting upbringing to say the very least. I don't, I don't think this happens in normal homes in America. I'm convinced it doesn't, uh, but it probably does on different levels, you know? Um, so, so it was, you know, it was kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, my mom's been great. She, uh, I, I was very worried about her. She uh, was and completely. Your mother, your mother, your mother. Tell us a little bit about your well-known mother. Yeah, she was completely devoted to my dad in, in almost a 1950s kind of way. You know, I mean, they were a team. There is no doubt about it. Uh, the same way Elena and I are a team. You know, and there's there's no question about it. Um, and, and she was devoted to him. She stayed with him up until the very end, a hundred percent. And I, I asked her at one point in time when my dad was quite ill and, you know, I said, what are you going to do when dad goes? Because, um, you know, that that's your world. And she looked me in the eye and she said, I am going to enjoy my time with your father as long as he is on this earth. And as soon as he is gone, I am going to go live my life and have a good time. And there are lots of things that I want to do, and then it'll be my time. And I kind of looked her at her and I said, you know what? She's going to be just fine. And I'm really proud of her. She's done exactly that. Uh, I think it's really hard for the widows of, of prominent people to kind of keep going. Uh, I think it's easy for them to kind of fade away. And she's done anything but that. Um, you know, I, 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 I have a hard time getting on her calendar. Um, you know, mom, where are you? Well, I'm going, I'm flying over to London, you know, where I'm, I'm going to go have tea with Camilla and then I'll be back on Thursday. I mean, it's ridiculous things like this. I said, you're fine. I don't need to worry about you in the least, you know? <laughs> so okay. it's just, so you know. uh, where did, where did you meet your wife? So we met, uh, we met actually at Wesleyan. Uh, we did not date for 10 years after, uh, after graduation. Um, you know, she was, uh, she was busy with medical school and I was busy, uh, with her career, but I knew who she was, uh, you know, cute girl. And uh, we were both living in Washington, D.C. and had kind of admired one another across the room for probably 10 years. And finally said, hey, you, you, you want to go out and, and, and give this a whirl? And um, she uh, she was graduating from medical school. She had a whole bunch of friends that were going to get a, a, a Euro rail passes and backpacks and go across Europe. And said, do you want to go? And I said, I'm running a bunch of TV stations. I can't do that. You know, um, and she was, well, come on, come on, come on. I said, well, okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I suppose I said, I'll take a cell phone and a, you know, and a ticket home. And if I got to come home, I come home, you know, no big deal. And she said, yeah, do that. Um, uh, I distinctly remember hiring Doug Hill, uh, to do weather for us from a train platform in Padova, Italy. Uh, I don't know why, but that, you know, that, that did happen. Uh, and that was, you know, I didn't, ha I didn't have to be recalled and one by one of all of her friends dropped off the trip and it wound up being just the two of us. And, uh, you know, I guess if you, if you go away, uh, traveling with a girl, uh, in Europe for five years, you go away as friends, you come home as a little bit more than friends. Um, well, so that, that set the stage. It was one of two ways. I, but yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. 
So I assume when you were growing up, you must have met a number of presidents your father knew reasonably well. So any presidents ever give you any great advice? Uh, great advice? No. I mean, you know, Reagan always had the great stories. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I did, uh, I had play dates with Amy, um, when, and, you know, after you've seen, uh, president Carter in his bathrobe on a Sunday, your, your image is just blown. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I always had great admiration for the Bush family. Um, I think they were, you know, they're good, good, really good folks. Uh, I think Obama was, you know, uh, he's it, it, such a such an interesting pivotal person in history um you know and, and really turned around an economy when it needed it and and you know just a, a really an interesting character and uh you know then then a few lunches with trump and those were probably some of the more amusing you know hours i've spent um okay so let's see anybody have any questions i'm looking at the uh, uh participants i don't see any hands up yet so, Mary, am I misreading it or what? Well, um, we can uh, go ahead and begin to take questions. Right, well, I'll, I'll ask a couple of people some questions and see, raise your hands. So, uh, Sam Feist, so you have a question? Yeah. Hi, thanks, David. Hi, Robert. Actually, I have a question, but I really want to hear more about your lunch with Trump than I want to hear the answer to my question. But you can, <laughs> you can choose which one. Um, I, you know, I, I was struck that something you said you, you called them. Um, you, you, you sort of referred to your kind of journalism as old fashioned. Um, and, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that today so much of the public is living in their own um, echo chamber where they're they're choosing the media that reflects their their own views. Um, and we all know what the problems uh, that causes. Um, where do you think that leaves traditional journalism um, that that really tries to be down the middle? Uh, not pick sides, not pick parties. Yeah, it's tough. I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I'm a pessimistic on it. I, I hate saying that, but I am. I think for traditional media, it's really tough because, you know, your audience is either left or right. And eventually you have to, you, you, you know, the, this worldview becomes self-perpetuating and, and, and you wind up sliding off the bubble one way or another because that's the only way you can, you can increase readership or, or subscribers. I think that's really true with all the, the consumer uh, level uh, uh, media outfits, and I don't have a solution for that. Um, I, I really enjoyed Politico because it was the opposite. You know, we were re we were writing for the David Rubin signs and the Sam Feist and the Brian Kellys of the world, and and you know, you guys really appreciated kind of knowing what was actually going on, getting the scrape shoot, getting the scoop. Um, you know, and 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 if and, and beat up on both sides equally. It's not like we were, you know, we weren't pulling any punches, but at least we were trying to, to you know beat up on both sides, kind of on an equal opportunity basis. Um, and it made it a heck of a lot easier writing for that audience. Um, you know, I, I think um, it, it allowed that kind of what I call old fashioned, what I mean, just, you know, just take it down the middle. Uh, tell me something interesting, you know, don't make it boring. Uh, you know, g give me something fresh. Um, I, I think that worked really, really well. And stay focused on what you know. Uh, I think that worked really, really well. And, you know, we, we just, we just kind of gave it away. There was some conversation when we first started about, are we going to charge? Are we not going to charge? And I was like, let's just give it away. Cause it, it's not, you know, we, we might as well just be a free site. And every time we looked at it afterwards, we said we're, we're better off just staying a free site because we just don't make that much money off the, you know, off the, the programmatic traffic um, that, you know, that's 4% of revenue which is unheard of for a, you know, kind of a big brand media organization. Um, the business was built on a very different kind of principles um, and very sustainable principles. Uh, you know, traffic can go up, traffic can go down. It, it doesn't really affect our bottom line that much. Um, so we had some built-in luxuries that I think other folks uh, just didn't have. And, and maybe that's the way things go in the future. You know, you've, you've just kind of got to do a lot more inside baseball and, and sell to folks uh, where you're providing, um, you know, actionable, unique, uh, real-time information that's, uh, you know, a part of their work, uh, where they're willing to pay big dollars to get access to that information. Um, you know, to me, that's that's a way you can, you, know, you can you can have a, a news organization that can can go forward, uh, you know, over a long-term, sustainable basis. Okay, um, Brian Kelly. Uh, yeah, David, thank you. Um, Robert, hi. Uh, 
so I wanted to, to expand on that, some of your thoughts about local and regional journalism, because I yeah. think that's the biggest hole in the marketplace. I mean, I know more about congressional subcommittees, thanks to you and some of the other folks, than, any, than anything that happens in, in the actual D.C. government. What, and you've had a foot in that both with Politico and, and TBD earlier. Yeah. What do you think? Is there a business model uh, to, to create some kind of local and regional journalism? What's your experience with Politico? There may be, you know, I know the Axios guys are kind of trying that out on a very small basis. Um, it's it's hard. Um, and, you know, it, in my mind, it really goes to media was set up based off uh, territorial exclusivities, um, you know, and, and territorial barriers to entry. Um, newspapers back in the day, they were expensive to set up. They were, exp- you know, cost of press is huge, cost of readership, huge, getting, getting that subscriber base, you know, very, very expensive. Once you were in place, it was very hard to dislodge you. Um, but that's evaporated now. The internet kind of had it evaporate. Um, I think uh, uh, broadcasting was next on the list. They were territorially exclusive because they had signals that covered, you know, certain metropolitan areas. And, and again, that seems to be evaporating kind of quickly. So I hate to say it, it, it probably has to get to the point where you deconstruct it all the way down to what does a community really need? And then, you know, something will come, will rise out of the ashes to, to replace it. But it, it, it's troubling to me. Um, you know, um, there, there was a lot of public service that happened there uh, between selling used cars, you know, where at least somebody was, was looking over the mayor's shoulder over at city hall to make sure he wasn't, you know, robbing the place blind. Um, and, and I, I don't know where that local watchdog goes. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it is going to be a challenge. Okay. Uh, Harsha Murthy. Hi, Robert. Could you tell us from your experience across the country, what are the advantages and disadvantages or challenges for the Washington DC area as we come out of COVID? Uh, especially for folks who are not running a media business. And question two, you've always stayed of, above the big tech connection, but as you saw what's happened over at the Post, where do you, what do you think is the direction of regulation going to be for organizations like Springer Politico? Yeah, good, two, two really good questions. So, I mean, coming out of COVID, you know, uh, David and I were talking about this. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of, of history. And uh, I, I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, COVID is, uh, you know, Spanish flu, uh, hundred years in the future. And, you know, we've been through two years of pain. Maybe we've got another, another painful round to go, but it eventually it becomes endemic. And eventually we get to the point where we get our flu shot and our COVID shot in October. And, um, you know, people are, they get sick, but they don't, they don't go to the hospital and they don't die. Um, and I think that would be a, a lovely way to kind of just get back to something that's a little more normal. I think as far as in, in the workplace, there have been probably some, some degrees of permanent shifts. I think there are, you know, we, we've successfully shown a lot of uh, white collar activity can be done outside of the workplace. Um, you know, if, if you don't, uh, if you don't have specific tools that are required to do your work at a, at a workplace, it can be done from just about anywhere. So there's going to be a shift there and that that's going to apply to real estate, um, you know, future of work all those sorts of things. Now, how far that elasticity goes, I don't know. I think um, we're going to spend the next five years, maybe more, societally kind of uh, um, experimenting um, with that. So that's, you know, that that's going to be a little bit of a problem. As far as media regulation, you know, uh, New York Times round one, round one against Sarah Palin. So I guess that's a, I guess it's a good thing. Um, I think the bigger question is kind of what happens to 230. Um, you know, um, I, I, tech is really fascinating. They always seem to be ahead of, uh, of the regulatory curve and, you know, Facebook has their own problems now, um, of being able just to expand and keep subscribers. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, uh, two th- whether two thirty stays or goes kind of becomes the least of their concerns. Um, but you know, that, that could be a death knell to them. Uh, it could be a death knell to a lot of social media. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I think it was put into place a long time ago to support some small companies, but uh, social media platforms, they, they are publishers, you know, we're held to one set of standards. They're held to another set of standards. Uh, and there's something fundamentally unfair about that. Um, and uh, I think that if, you know, if social media platforms were actually held accountable for the pieces that they publish by individuals, um, you know, societally, that might not be the worst thing that would, could happen. Okay. Uh, Tony. 
Uh, you're, unmute yourself. Yep. yep. Thank you, and <laughs> Robert. Great to see you. Um, hey, I was I've actually quoted in the 15th anniversary story in in uh, Politico, uh, and I, I think it's something like um, something like uh, you know, 15 years ago when you guys came out uh, and they asked me what I thought, I said I. I said, I'm rooting for those guys, but I wouldn't bet on them. Right. Uh, and the reason I wouldn't that, either. <laughs> right. <laughs> the reason was, that, you know, what I saw, well, like, I hope, I hope these, I love these guys and I hope they do well. We could use it. But obviously, the Washington Post has resources and they should own that space and they should come in and just squash them and take the competition and go do it. And that didn't happen. You really disrupted and had to keep evolving and you've evolved it, you know, evolved with the tip sheets, you know, first we did like news fast and all the time with great talent, every other news organization has, you know, uh, Politico veterans, you know, right. that are their star talent now. Yeah. Uh, but you also have something else, you know, and now we have like, everybody has a tip sheet, you know, then you guys started pro, everybody has a pro vertical now. Um, and, uh, and, and now we've seen like a lot of, in fact, former Politico people who are competing in delivering news in lots of different uh, in lots of different ways, not just Axios, but also you know uh, you know our friends on the Hill and others. Sure. Uh, so what about like just the barriers to entry today seem low, and and people are doing some really excellent things. And or do you worry about that co- the competition that way? Yeah, I think it's, you know I think it's a fair point. Uh, I, I I do think it's possible to kind of come in. There, there there's certain stages and levels to this whole thing. You know I think. Uh, interestingly, you know, um, I had a couple of conversations and, you know, uh, uh, Jim Van de High and Mike Allen, when they first started Axios, I know had contemplated kind of doing what Jake Sherman and Anna Palmer did at, at Funchbowl of just doing kind of a very focused newsletter based off what, what Mike Allen was doing. And, uh, they decided to go a different way, which was sort of to, to get to a, a bigger platform kind of thing. We've, we've continued on that path and, you know, and, and are getting into a whole bunch of other things that are, that are really hard for a small organization to do. Um, the pro verticals are hard. That's, you know, that's a 150 person operation. Those are expensive to start up. They're expensive to get going. Um, takes a lot of capital and, and you know, and, and takes a, a lot of access to talent to really make those work. Um, so I, I think it's easy to kind of do the, the, the micro, which can be very profitable. The margins on it are great. Uh, but then what do you grow after that? You know, where, where, do, where do you kind of take it from there? And then how much of that complete ecosystem do you have to offer clients? Um, that becomes a little more of, of, of the challenge going forward. Hey, Monica, unmute yourself. Yes. Um, so you mentioned technology always being ahead of the curve and you can't <laughs> go, you know, a day without reading about who's setting up space in the metaverse, whether it's retail or even professional services firms right now. And so I'd be curious on your perspective on, you know, media and metaverse and, and all things there where you think it might go. Oh God, I, I am, I am getting old. Cause you know, uh, I don't know, my, my, my 14 year old walks around with an Oculus on all day long. It drives me absolutely insane. You know, I, you know, I was like, aren't you going to bump into a wall? Um, but you know, I, look, I, it, it, it'll, it'll evolve, I, but I think at the heart of at least what we do with media, with, with the heart of all this are still very, uh, very human connections. Um, you know, we, uh, we're storytellers. We like stories. We like communicating with pe- folks. We like exchanging information in, um, you know, in compelling ways. Um, what I've seen with technology is just enabling that on different levels and, and enabling it on levels that, uh, that human evolution probably hasn't really caught up with yet. Um, you know, um, I, I think uh, the, the ability for social media platforms and, and what will happen with this, and, and, and quite frankly, I kind of see the metaverse as kind of an extension of that, you know, uh, where you are now suddenly connecting people, um, again, you're, you're breaking geographical barriers with it. You know, if I'm interested in underwater basket weaving, there are 17 people around the globe at various places who have the same interests that I do. That it was not possible for us to connect prior to this. And that that is the huge factor in media and tech that kind of is, is the differentiating factor from my point of view. I think you're right on that falling down part. My son almost fell off the sofa yesterday when we were both exploring space with our Oculus goggles. Yeah, he's, he asked me to do it. I tell him it makes me queasy and I, I just refuse. Okay, uh, Prashant, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> hi, Robert. How so you doing? This is, 
I'm doing well. So this is probably an, uh, you know, almost segueing from that question. I have a 13-year-old. And while he's, you know, he's smart and I you know, coach some of his uh, classmates in the life, you know, the thing is, this audience is like the, all of us, I think, grew up reading multiple newspapers. This generation, my son, or even like the you know, kids and the teenagers, don't read newspapers. They don't even read news magazines. They're getting all of the information from you know, Insta, Facebook, YouTube, and the web. And it's all like snippets here, there, and it's coming from multiple sources. So that's actually a challenge. I'm trying to figure out how do I, even, even if he's going online, direct him to sort of credible sources versus just Joe Blow, who's giving some, uh, some updates. So I guess my question is, A, do you have some sense for what the age uh, distribution of your readership was, number one. And number two is when you see something like political or any outfit like that evolving into when my you know, son and his generation grow up old enough to be you know, the, the target audience. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's fair. So, you know, we spend a lot of time kind of thinking about what we do and then spend a lot of time thinking about kind of what, whatever, what everyone else's position is in the media world. Uh, and you know, I go back to we're really fortunate. You know, we're we were really writing to most people who are on this Zoom. Um, you know, you guys are kind of our target audience. So, it, you know, what, what we write to a Politico is 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 a much more uh, educated, uh, you know, nuanced, engaged, focused audience. Um, you know, when we talk about kind of when we when we kind of go down to general public and then we go even further down and say, you know, where, where does next generation kind of get their news and information from, you know, I like to think that so long as we can continue to, uh, uh, you know, have this, this system that we've got, which really, if you think about it, it, it we, we kind of have this ultimate progressive tax system, you know, the, the 1% of influentials and the 1% of, of our readership pays for the, the journalism that the other 99% enjoy. If we can continue to find, ways that we can continue to do that, then voices like Politico will at least be out there for people to latch into and read. And, you know, we, we're, we're pretty agnostic as to how we distribute our news and information. So, you know, if it's through social media, if it's through snippets, if it's through long form, we'll, we'll do it in any way. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that kind of uh, filters down to folks, but um, but I, you know, I go back to there, there, there are some big issues here uh, and there's some big issues with, uh, with 230, there's some big issues with, you know, foreign powers kind of being able to, to, to create completely false narratives uh, that massive numbers of people read. I think it's a, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed that, that it hasn't, the, the, the threat to national security hasn't, hasn't caused a backlash in it to, to a bigger degree than it has yet. Um, and maybe it will. Maybe that's, maybe that's the next act. Well, thank you very much, Robert, uh, for this. <laughs> and uh, enjoyable conversation. And uh, thanks for your service to um, the Economic Club of Washington, among other things, okay? David, thank you very much. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, bye. Thanks.